Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to finish off the lecture I didn't quite get to last time, the last little piece, and that is the phylum Echinodermata. And the Echinodermata are things like the sea stars um, or starfish, as we used to call them as a kid. A lot of people don't like that term now because the fish part makes people think it's a fish. And um, we laugh at that sometimes like, oh, that would never happen. But but I've run into people that um, when you use a term like that, that later on you find out they really think that's a fish and um, and that might be trouble. So sea stars and other animals um, in that group, many tide pool uh, groups of organisms we could see on a field trip. So phylum, Echinodermata. First of all, they are first and foremost, they are our first group that we've seen in doing this that are deuterostomes, which means the blastopore um, becomes the anus. So remember when we did the development and we talked about the gastrula and the first hole that an animal has on its body or the first hole that a person has on their body because the echinoderms and us humans are deuterostomes, that first hole becomes the anus. So the blastopore becomes the anus with annelids and arthropods and things of that sort. Before that, they're protostomes. So that first opening um, became the first, the blastopore became the mouth. So this is reversed. And we talk about these things because um, and these characteristics because development is a very key, important characteristic um, in classifying and identifying organisms because when you make changes in development early on, those changes have larger effects on the organism as a whole um, as you move forward. Um, so development, uh, there's a famous biologist, Ernest Haeckel, which I might have mentioned at some point, but famous phrases, um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, essentially meaning that if you look at um, the developmental pattern of an animal, it kind of shows you how it might be related to other animals because development is so important. So we have our deuterostomes. They are radially symmetrical, like a tire, like a wheel, uh, and they have indeterminate cleavage, uh, which allows things like stem cell research in our case, um, where those other organisms can be used, um, or those cells can be used to become other things. Um, so that's indeterminate cleavage. And also their coelom develops via enterocelous development. So it forms as little pockets. It doesn't split the mesoderm. Instead, the mesoderm forms from little pockets that arise out of the uh, animal during the gastrula stage. So they also have a water vascular system. They're radially symmetrical, like we mentioned before, and they have a water vascular system and they have an ambulacral groove, which is like a, a channel for which this water vascular system runs down, the ambulacral groove. We'll talk more about that. And they have a structure called a madreporite, which um, I think is right here on this one. It's kind of a light, it depends on the species, I'm sure, but, but I think that cream colored thing in the center. Anyway, it's a little, it's like a little plate uh, at the top of the, or it depends on the uh, animal, but in a sea star, it's on the top of it. And it's where the water goes into the water vascular system. And all the echinodermata are marine. So we'll take a look a little bit more at this water vascular system here. Um, and so the water flows through this system. We'll go through the parts here as I put them up on the screen. So first of all, um, if, you, if you sort of took all the other parts of the animal away, what you would have is what you see here, which is the start of the water vascular system, which is the madreporite. The water goes in there and it goes down the stone canal into this part called the ring canal. And then from the ring canal, it goes down the radial canals, which go down to the arms like that. And then from the radial canals, it goes, it's not in my picture here, but um, right up here after radial canal, lateral canal. So these are the lateral canals. I guess I wrote it down there thinking, oh, I added it. How about that? There was a time when I thought 
hey, I got to add that. So and I did, and then I forgot about it. Anyway, those are the lateral canals. And then that goes to this little bulb right there. That's called the ampulla. And then that's connected at the other end to a tube foot, uh, which are the little suction cup kinds of things. So the idea is that water can go into this madreporid and through this water vascular system and the sea star can change the pressure in there by changing the amount of water um, moving in and out of that water vascular system. And that's what allows a sea star or other kinds of echinoderms to grip onto rocks. If you've ever seen a sea star with its little uh, tube feet, or if you tried to pull it off a rock um, or try to pick it up, the, the suction cup parts are part of the water vascular system. Those are the tube feet, and that's what allows it to grip to the rock. Okay. And we have several classes we'll go through, um, like we've done with other things. So we'll go through each one of those. Uh, so we have the phylum and kind of dermata, and then we have several classes within those. So we'll start with the one you're probably most familiar with, which is the class Asteroidea. And the Asteroidea are the sea stars. Um, and there's many different species of sea stars. Um, they, many of them, most of them have five arms that radiate out of a central disc like you see here. Uh, but there are some species that have more arms, multiple arms, uh, but most of them look like this you see here. And um, one of the ways we um, classify the um, echinoderms is based on that ambulacral groove uh, or that um, water vascular system and, and what the ambulacral uh, plate is doing in the animal. So in this particular one, the asteroidea have an open ambulacral groove. And what that means if, is if you turn the sea star over, um, you can see these go away little pin stick up thing. You can see these sort of um, channels. So if you had a blunt probe, you could run the blunt probe through the channel there. And that's because it's an open ambulacral groove. It's a groove and it's open. So you can run a pencil or a blunt probe through there, through the um, center there. Now, if it was closed, I'll show you later one that's closed. Uh, it would be a solid plate. Uh, so a closed ambulacral groove just would mean that you wouldn't see this groove here. It'd be straight across. It'd be flat and you couldn't stick a probe or anything in there because the plate would be closed. In this case, it's open. And sea stars, uh, the asteroidia have the madreporite. Remember that's the thing with the water goes into, they have it on the aboral side. Aboral means the opposite of oral. So on a sea star, the if this is your typical sea star cruising around, the mouth is underneath here, it's on the bottom, and the madreporite is somewhere here on top, okay? So the mouth is on the opposite side uh, as the madreporite. And they also contain uh, pedicillaria, and papillae. Papillae are these, they're also called dermal gills. They're these little tiny projections. They look like little tiny miniature nipples sticking out of the sea star. And those are used for respiration. They pick up oxygen uh, and things of that sort that are in the floating around in the water. And that's how the sea star breathes. Um, the pedicillaria um, are these very tiny little pinchers. They look like, um, they almost look like a little flower, um, but, but they, they can open and close. They're like little pinchers and we'll see them in lab. I'll show you, um, uh, we have a microscope slide of them out. You can't really see them here um, in, in these pictures right here, but in lab, we'll have the little pincher, the pedicillaria, uh, and those are used to keep things from growing on the sea star. So they cover, the sea star and they pinch anything that would try to grow on it. So you don't have things growing on top of things like sea stars because of the pedicillaria. And if I remember, I'll put uh, pedicillaria up when I edit the video. Um, and sometimes I'm good about that. And most of the time I'm not good about that, but you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Who said that? Miss Fitzharris, right? One of the most brilliant teachers ever. One of the 
people I learned the most from and Mrs. Fitzharris. Uh, Mrs. Fitzharris. And she's retired. She just retired recently. She wasn't even my teacher. She was my kid's preschool teacher. And we still use Miss Fitzharris. If you're out there listening to this, I don't know why you would learn about sea stars. But anyway, you get what you get. You don't throw a fit. Use it all the time. Great lesson. Totally worth it. Anyway, I don't even know why I, where I was going with that. But the next group is the class Opthyroidia. And the Opthyroidia look like sea stars but they're not quite. They are in the class Opthyroidia, and they're also called brittle stars is their common name. Um, and they look superficially like sea stars, but they have some, some pretty significant differences. I'll show you here in a second. Uh, first of all, they have five thin arms that radiate out from a central disc. So they still have the five arms that you see there, but they have a closed ambulacral groove, which means that if you were to flip it over and look at the water vascular system, it would be a plate. It would be a covered plate. You can't run a probe or pencil down the middle of it. Their madreporite is on the oral side. So the oral side again is on the bottom and the madreporite in the ophthyroidia is also on the bottom. So that's different than what you see in sea stars. Also, they do not have suckers on their two feet and they don't have pedicillaria and they don't have the papillae. So when you're down at the tide pools or you're looking for brittle stars, you usually find brittle stars underneath rocks, not on top um, because the brittle stars can't grip the rocks. They can't hold on to the rocks uh, because they don't have suckers on the tube feet. So they hide underneath the rocks. They kind of crawl. And if they were to be hit by a wave out crawling around a rock, it would knock them off. So superficially, they look quite like sea stars, but not quite. Okay. Then we have the next group, which are sea urchins. Uh, they are called the Echinoidea class, Echinoidea, and those again are called sea urchins. This is what a sea urchin looks like in case you've never seen one. There's different versions of it. This is a local one we have here that's purple. We also have a red one. There are many different species and some are bigger uh, than others and some are smaller than others. Uh, they have no arms. Uh, but they have five rows of tube feet. Uh, they have spines on them, as you can see there. They have closed ambulacral grooves. Uh, they have a madreporite that is on the aboral side. So uh, again, remember aboral means the opposite of oral. So in a um, in a in this thing um, in a sea urchin, the bottom underneath it. That's where the mouth is. So the madreporite is somewhere up here. It's down here and you can't see it in this case, but you can see it if you can look around in one through a microscope. So the madreporite's on the aboral side. They also contain pedicillaria, so they have the little pinchers. Um, and under a microscope, you can actually see the pedicillaria uh, under a dissecting scope. So they are, the pedicillaria are small, but they're not um, um, super, super tiny. You can see them with a dissecting scope at, say, three or four times magnification. You probably see them with a, if you had good eyes, you might be able to see them without anything. Um, but with a magnifying glass, you could probably see them. So they're kind of that kind of level of small. So they have pedicillaria. They also have the papillae like um, sea stars, and they have this structure called Aristotle's lantern, which is what you see right here. Aristotle's lantern is this complex set of jaws and attachments of like uh, ligament types of things, and they use it to chew. So Aristotle's lantern is a feeding structure connected to these sort of teeth-like things on the bottom, and they use it to chew off um, kelp, holdfasts, and things of that sort. Um, so uh, aerosol's lantern is kind of a unique feature to the echinoidea. Nothing else seems to have that. Now, um, just to show you, um, this is the live sort of version of the um, sea urchin. And when it dies, if it were to die or and the spines were all to fall off, you would have this round ball that is left. Now this one's broken, but this is half of that round ball. 
So if you imagine if you took all those spines off, this is the bottom of that ball. So what you see here, you should try to think about and take a guess here. Go away thing that popped up. What is this, do you think, here? What's, what are those? And I know you're watching this online. And, what, and then what are these? So you might be watching online and you're, and you're like, your brain is sort of like just sitting there taking it in. But what you should do is you should try to do the output part, which is you make your brain try to generate the answer. Um, this is far better uh, for learning. So if you look at it and you're like, what could that be? Well, notice if you look at there's five of them. What else do we know that we saw five of five rows of tube feet? So what this is, these are the tube feet right here on the sides. And there's five arms, essentially. And so that right there, that's the closed ambulacral groove. So if you took a C star, basically, and you folded its arms all the way up into a ball and then grew spines all over you, you'd kind of have that. So that's what it is. So this, you can't see the C star in it when it's alive, but this is the part where you can see these rows of tube feet where it's C star like, if you will. Okay. Then we have the class crinoidea and the crinoidea look like this. They're a deep sea or bottom dwelling ocean organism with these um, branched arms. And they have, they're kind of an unusual one. They have open ambulacral grooves, but they have no madreporite, no pedicillaria, no papillae. So they don't really... Um, they're really like a suspension feeder. They catch things that are falling um, in the water column um, as currents and things move nutrients around. So they're not grabbing things. They're not predators uh, like some of the other ones. Okay. So that's the crinoidea. And then the last group is the holithoroidea. And the holithoroidea are the sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers. And we always make some kind of joke about the knife there, the knife's there because this is a really big sea cucumber and they have the knife in there for reference just to show you how big it is. So if you're a diver, um, you might have uh, a knife on you or whatever you have. Normally when you take a picture of something you want to do reference, you put a quarter down or something, but I imagine if you're diving, uh, you don't have a quarter on you. So you put your diving knife in there and that gives you a sense of size uh, on, on how big that might be. So they are soft bodied organisms. They have ambulacral areas. This might be the most unusual group of the phylum, Echinodermata, the class Holothoroidea. So they have these, they don't have these tube rows. They don't have rows or arms. Instead, they have these areas. They have ambulacral areas like plates and they're closed. They're closed ambulacral grooves although they're not a channel, it's like a plate. Um, but in lab, there's a question. I think we fixed it now. I think we fixed it a long time ago, actually. But it says, do they have open or closed ambulacral grooves? And there's no answer to it. The answer is they're closed. Closed ambulacral areas or grooves. They have an internal madreporite and they have no pedicillary or papillae uh, either. Um, and again, they're a, a usually a bottom dwelling organism. They look sort of like a slug, but they're not related to a slug because they're deuterostomes and they have this water vascular system. So they are in fact an echinoderm um, and not a gastropod of some sort. Okay. So that'll be the end there of the um, echinodermata. And I think that'll finish off this particular lecture I set out to do once before. From here on out, we're going to move into chordates after this. And as we move through chordates, uh, we'll talk about fish and then reptiles and amphibians and then birds and mammals and a little bit of physiology. And then we'll be done. And just like that, um, the semester will be over, um, which won't feel just like that, probably. Uh, but, you know, you're going to do it. You're tough. You're going to make it, I think. I hope um, you will. Okay? You're going to do it. You got to do it. Okay? unless you don't do it. And then, um, you know, I've seen that happen too, but we're going to do the best we can. 
and um, and things are sometimes beyond your control, but um, that's what we do. That's how you make it through. Um, I'll tell you other stories later on about it, but um, um, even in difficult times, if you sort of regroup yourself, and you have a chance to regroup, you can do quite often things you didn't think were possible. Okay, so that'll be the end for today. And I will see you next time. Hope everyone's doing well. And I'll talk with you later.